Hi again, everybody. Dr. Lee Coleman, thank you again for coming. And last time we left off with uh, Dr. Summit's so-called accommodation syndrome and the lack of any real foundation for what he was claiming and his basically denial that children would ever make false allegations. And what I told you was that he didn't develop that first. He was really mirroring what he was being told. He was meeting with social workers who were already had been indoctrinated with a certain kind of thinking. And then he became kind of like a spokesperson, wrote a very influential article. So what we want to do now is look at, well, where did these ideas come from that were transmitted to him? And a very, very powerful source was the Juvenile Probation Department of the Santa Clara County uh, Mental Health System, Henry Giaretto, as the head of a program which was funded by the state of California to work with police and to handle cases where it was a belief that a child had been sexually abused. So I want to read from a book that was published by this child sexual abuse treatment program. This is the kind of book that would be a part of the materials for the trainees who began to come for workshops to teach them how to do the work of the new programs that were being developed all over California and dozens of other states quickly developed because funding was made available for it. So let me, this is now the uh, uh, spokesperson for the San Jose Police Department speaking to an audience full of social workers and other professionals who might become part of a new sexual abuse prevention team in their local, uh, the area where they lived. So I'm now reading from the book, San Jose Police Department speaking to the new recruits in the movement. And for example, they say, when someone else, that is not the child, when someone else reports the molestation, the children may deny it to us at first. Then we approach them with, quote, daddy may have a sickness. Now if daddy had a broken leg, we would want him to go to the orthopedic doctor and get his leg fixed. An orthopedic doctor is one who fixes broken bones. You'd want him to go to the doctor for his broken leg, wouldn't you? She can't deny that, end quote. Uh, and, and, sorry, next quote. And, and if daddy had appendicitis, we would take him to a surgeon who specializes in people with sick stomachs. And you wouldn't want him to get to that doctor, you would want him to get to that doctor as soon as possible, wouldn't you? She can't deny that either. And if daddy has something wrong in his head with how he thinks, we would take him to a psychiatrist to get him help. You'd want him to get help for any of these things that are wrong, wouldn't you? End quote from the police officer. The, the victim usually will concur by now so we say, quote, okay, I've been told that maybe daddy has a little sickness and his, in his head, and we're here to try to help daddy get better. We have to be honest with them. So when they ask, what's going to happen to daddy, we say, I can't say for sure. Maybe he'll have to go to jail for a little while, or maybe he won't have to go at all. But it won't be permanent. If he does go to jail, he'll only be gone for a little while, only a few months. So we finished the interview with the child, getting information about how the perpetrator approached her, things he said to her, where he touched her and she him, and when he asked her and when he asked her to whether he bribed her or told her it was a secret to be kept between them. We want to get the family hooked into our program as soon as possible. Once the officer has gotten statements from both the mother and the victim, he goes to the telephone and calls our office. And if I go on a little later, he's, they say that 
Sometimes a man won't come in. Then the department must use whatever means it has available to bring him in and get a confession. There are generally two kinds of fathers. The ones who are so relieved to have the molestation exposed that they confess everything to the officer at once, and the others who deny or partially deny because they're too afraid to admit. So, now me talking again, not from the manual. There's no mention of the possibility that the accused man may not have done what they have gotten the child to say through the process I just read to you. It's simply nowhere in the manual. Only two kinds of fathers. In this case, their focus ex was almost exclusively was on in the family incest accusation. So the mindset of the police who were working with the child sexual abuse treatment program and Henry Giaretto's program was if somebody reports that something happened, there's only two kind of people. They're either the ones who will admit or the ones who deny. The ones who admit did it and the ones who deny, well, that's what molesters do. And then finally, to you know, try to summarize, they finish up by saying the process of investigation and connecting the family to the child sexual abuse treatment program is compressed into a few hours. We get a confession from the father. He is persuaded to stay out of the home and not have contact with the child. The connection to the treatment program and Parents United sponsors is made the police go right to the district attorney with the evidence and a complaint is filed. Well, of course, you could only do it that way if you had adopted this idea that children can never be led to say something unless it actually happened. So let me explain that a little more because that is really the fundamental flaw that persists to this day. You have the desire to protect children from sexual abuse. And you've been trained to believe that the child is not going to tell you that they've been abused unless they have been abused. Children don't lie about sexual abuse is with the claim that's being made. And a corollary to that is you should believe the child, meaning that when they tell you about sexual abuse, you believe them. What isn't said is if they tell you they weren't, you don't believe them. Because that contradicts the other thing you've been taught is they would never say they were unless they were. So there is a denial. This kind of thinking involves a denial that it's possible to get a child for some other reason to say it, that is to persuade them to Tell, to show that you are sure that it happened and to, in other, in variety of ways, encourage them to acknowledge that what you think is true is true, that you cannot get a child to say something that is untrue by that process. Now, if you've been trained in that kind of thinking, which is what this program was all about, by the time this book was written, there were already such programs in 22 states. By now, every state has treatment programs based on this kind of thinking. If you are a social worker or a police officer and you want to work in the field of protecting children from sexual abuse and you've been trained in this way, you come out of it with the belief that children have a hard time talking about any sexual abuse that might have occurred. We all agree with that one. They will never acknowledge, they'll never say something happened if it didn't happen. It's just not something the child's going to say, because that's what they taught me. And they may need my kind of help. I'm this trainee, and the trainee wants to be good and feels that they are good and really care about children, so that you end up with a feeling, you've been trained to have the feeling 
that you demonstrate not only how much you care about protecting children, but you demonstrate how good you are at doing it by overcoming the hesitation of the child and telling you about it. So that every time you succeed in getting a child to finally acknowledge, finally say that something happened, it demonstrated that you're one of the people that is good enough to help them overcome the things that are getting in the way with no need to worry about the fact that you might have either created the situation which led them to say it or more frequently you became one more influence in a chain of influences which is leading them to saying it. That is, you were not deterred by the roadblocks in the way, the child's hesitation, the embarrassment, the fear. Now we all acknowledge that if a child has been molested, they may have those feelings. But what the system has not acknowledged is they don't have to have been molested in order to end up with a, making statements and having a belief that they were. Now, what I'm telling you now is, uh, is the explanation for why intelligent and well-meaning people from social work and from law enforcement can make the same mistakes over and over and over again of overlooking crucial topics in favor of just getting the child to go along with the idea or say that they were a molest victim. Because when they investigate the case, it's terribly important that you find out who has been talking to the child before you got there. How would you know whether a process has been initiated of influencing the child if you're not interested in that topic? If you're not interested in it, you're not going to ask the right questions. You're not going to be sure to talk to the, the right people. And that's what the current system does. The current system, police officers go out when an allegation is reported. They usually do a cursory interview. They often do not tape record that interview. When you study the written record of what they've done, you can see that there's been little, if any, attention paid to the possibility that the child may have been put under some kind of pressure, or there might be something that should raise doubts. They then schedule an interview that is going to be recorded, usually <clears throat> on videotape. And that interviewer <clears throat> fails to really look into anything which might raise doubt. They only look to get the child to describe the abuse which is assumed from the beginning. What we need to do now is look a little more at actual transcripts of interviews so you don't have to take my word for it. We've already done that somewhat with the McMartin case. I would love it if you go back and review the time when I did that with none other than Key McFarlane as the leader of the team. She was right there at the beginning of helping this program get started and then moved to Los Angeles where she was in a position to do those interviews. So when you come back from the next session, <clears throat> let's illustrate with the actual questioning and see just how extreme it can be. But now that you have the understanding that if you are given the task of supposedly investigating whether a child has been molested, but instead you are all filled up with the attitude of a therapist. The therapist thinks my job is to help a child that's been molested, but you're an investigator, then you're not really investigating. And that's what has happened is people from child protection, social work departments, and police start acting like they're therapists when they say things, you know, if daddy had a sickness in his head, wouldn't you want him to get help? Or, you know, it's never the child's fault, so forth and so on. These are things which you would think might come from a therapist who had an independent way of knowing that something had happened. So 
come back and we'll start looking at some examples from actual transcripts of interviews. See you next time.